Awesome, man. Again, we're here again, guys. Hey, how's everyone doing? Hope everyone's fine. The Pen Files brings you another chapter of the unique book from pen to pen. The Pen Files, again, presents to you another chapter of our book from pen to pen. The illustrious story that talks about an individual making a transition from one episode to another episode in his life. From one chapter of his life to another chapter in his life. Today we're going to uh, mark down chapter number six. Chapter number six. Chapter number six is entitled PPS. PPS. Now, the question is, what does PPS stand for? What does PPS mean? What does PPS mean? PPS is the Philadelphia prison system. For those that don't know, PPS is the Philadelphia prison system. It's a prison system right here in Philadelphia houses close to anywhere from two to 5,000, many times more, all depends on uh, what facilities are open, what facilities are being utilized to house individuals from Philadelphia. Today, we're gonna examine the PPS. We're gonna examine the components of the PPS and why. Why the PPS? So today, again, that's our focus. We begin with what it stands for, Philadelphia prison system. But it's, it's bigger than that. It's very, very much more bigger than the concept, the acronym PPS. Again, we're making the transition, the transition of the acronyms. We're uh, traveling through and making pit stops. We're traveling through on a journey. And these are all the places where we stopped. These are all the places that make up this story from pen to pen. So today we include another pit stop of our journey. Here's one point I want everyone to look at and really, really understand and examine if you can. For all the examiners, all the researchers, we must learn how to research. We must learn how to research, to examine and analyze information and trace the information back to the initial source to make sure that the information is accurate or inaccurate. If you go to the back of my book, you're gonna see that list and list of references. I have lists and lists of references which support many of the statements in the book. Because the things that I say, it's not stuff that I'm just making up. It's not things that I'm saying just to sound good. But rather, there are things that are being said based on information that's already been researched, already been examined. Statistical analysis has already been used to determine what kind of a society we have. Statistical analysis has been used to determine what kind of society do we have in comparison with other societies. Can we say America is the leading industry for education? When you come to Philadelphia, you're gonna find that many schools have been closed down because of the budget. Or is that the, that's what's being said? 
Schools are not being open, but schools are being closed. And the offset of that, prisons are being built. Schools are being closed and prisons are being built. But here's one point that everyone really, really needs to look at and understand that our society, the society that we live at, live in called America, America is only 5% of the world's population. Pay attention, 5%. America is only 5% of the world's population, but they make up more than 25% of the prison industrial complex. Let that, let that marinate a little bit. Think about that statement. Think about those numbers. Now ask yourself the question, can we do better? Can America do better? Why does America consist of a quarter of the prison industrial complex in the world, but only makes up 5%? Where are the other four? Where, where are the other four? Five times five is 25, correct? 5% of the country globally? We should have no more than 5%. 5% 5 or less of the prison industrial complex. However, we're taking four other countries and we're taking from them. You have four more countries. All of them have 5%. We have more than all of those put together. America is what? The leading industry in this field. We're talking about the home of technology, the home of science, of science, the home of statistical analysis, and also the home of the largest population of prisoners in the world. So we go and we move on to PPS the prison, the Philadelphia prison system. What will help you understand what the Philadelphia prison system is? How can it be explained? How can it be defined? We have on one block, CFCF, Carbon Fraho. Correctional facility. House of Correction. Detention Center. Philadelphia Industrial Correctional Center. PIC. RCF, Riverside Correctional Facility. Holmesburg. And we have a few modules, some satellites all throughout the city. Why so many? Why so many? For a small place like Philadelphia. But when you enter these facilities, you're gonna look and examine and see one thing. And that's a target population. 
when you enter these facilities, you're going to see one thing that's going to stand out. Who are the occupants of this of these institutions? But I want you to step outside that box and go into these same communities where they live and where they reside. And I want you to look at the institutions of education. The ones that are failing, the ones that are not succeeding. So when you examine these individuals from the field of education, and you look at these individuals in the field of incarceration, you're going to see a real, a, a very big difference. You're going to see a very big difference. And in some cases, you're going to see similarities. Because when you look deep inside the Philadelphia community, all of the communities are not affected to the point that they end up or or or, or are inmates inside the Philadelphia prison system. So if you go to the urban society of Philadelphia, you're going to find a large population of the urban community resides on state road. A large part of the urban community resides on state road, home of detention center, house of correction, Philadelphia Industrial Correctional Center, and the likes. But when you go to the urban communities, you see that this school is closed down. You see that that school is closed down. You see that this school is closed down. You see that that school is closed down. Why are the schools closing, but the prisons are open? Now let's go to the process. Now let's examine the process of what happens and what takes place. How do you end up in a place called the Philadelphia prison system? First, you're arrested. How are you arrested is the question. How was a person arrested just out of the clear blue? In Philadelphia, we have this thing called profiling. In Philadelphia, you can easily be profiled. And once you're profiled, you have a target on your back. That target may say, come and arrest me. That target may say, come and rob me. That target may say, come and shoot me. The question is, what target do you belong to? Are you part of a target population based on your racial epitome? How you look. How you look is being put on display. Are you a victim of racial profiling? So you have to ask yourself, when you get up in the morning, when you dress, when you go to the barbershop, when you go to the nail salon, when you go to the beauty salon, what is your identity? How are you going to look when you come outside into the environment? And am I going to be racially profiled based on my identity. Will a haircut 
get me picked out of a lineup? Will the black hood Will a pair of Jordans get me picked out of a lineup? A person reports a robbery. The description of the individual that they report, black male, 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, a lot of hair, black hoodie, black, she black jeans, white sneakers. Is that a description? Last seen in the vicinity of Broad and Erie. Now let's stop. Let, let's stop for a minute, for one minute, one moment. If we was to go to Broad and Erie right now, you know what we'll find? You know how many people we'll find with a black hoodie on, with a lot of hair, jeans, white sneakers? So is that a fair enough identity form of identification? I don't care who they bring back. I don't bring, care who they bring back as a suspect. Many times, the person just want them to catch somebody because all they want is what was taken from them. So if the person has a lot of money in his pocket, and this person was robbed for a certain amount of money. Is this guy guilty for robbing this individual because he has three hundred dollars in his pocket, and the person was, you know, that got robbed, he had, he was robbed of a hundred dollars, and the officer says, "Does this look like the money that was taken?" What's the difference between a twenty dollar bill? This $20 bill and that $20 bill, what's the difference? This $100 bill, that $100, what's the difference? How do you make a determination about an individual and says that this is the one that robbed me, but you really didn't see his face? All you see was he had a lot of hair, he had on a black hoodie, he had on jeans, and a white pair of sneakers. And because of that, he's arrested. Lo and behold, the man was just eating in this restaurant. And he's been there for the last hour and a half. The person says, this just happened 10 minutes ago. He's sitting eating in this restaurant, but this person was robbed 10 minutes ago. And as he comes out of the restaurant to proceed to leave, he's pulled over by a police officer. And the police officer identifies him based on the description given. And now this individual is arrested. Just like that. He's arrested for robbery. And if they said he had a gun, even if the police officer doesn't find one, he's going to be arrested with possession of instrument of crime. He has a weapon. Because the person said they put a gun to my head. So now this guy has a robbery, felony in the first degree, possession of instrumental crime, another misdemeanor, along with a list of other charges that they, they conjure up. Simple assault, he didn't touch him. Aggravated assault, he didn't touch him. But this guy has that now. Terroristic threats, receiving stolen property. He has a list of charges. You'd be like, yo, where did these charges come from? Based on the statement that the witness gave, 
Now, all of this information goes to the district attorney's office. The district attorney determines whether or not this case moves forward. If the case moves forward, the man's been arrested. Now, Miranda can come. You have the right, right to remain silent. Now, he's being charged. What happens next? Now he has to go in front of a bail commissioner. Now he has to go in front of a bail commissioner with these charges. Now, mind you, you're talking about an individual who is just eating. Huh? Just eating. But because of the fact that his identity is the same identity for more than 30 to 40% of the African American males in Philadelphia, this individual is arrested. So now what happens? He goes in front of a bell commissioner, bell commissioner. You know, they do, they do a little investigation before the bell, find out if he's working, find out if he has a place to live, find out if he has this, if he has that. They want to know. What's your, what's your qualifications of making bail? Do you have a job? You're going to need a lawyer. Can you afford a lawyer? If you tell them you have a job and you're making this amount of money, that amount of money, they're going to stay going to skyrocket the bill. The bill is going to be skyrocketed. Very, very high bill. But if you say you're unemployed, the bill may be a little lower, but it's going to also be a little high. Not as high as the one who is employed. Another racial profile. Another racial profile. So now... We have an individual sitting, awaiting to go in front of a bail commissioner, and now he goes in front of the bail commissioner, and the bail commissioner says, you know, based on what we see here, I mean, he doesn't have any convictions, he doesn't have a history of criminal activity, but so-and-so picked him out and said he was the one. Bell is set at $200,000. $200,000. Because he lives in Philadelphia, he, he has the right to make the bell. He can make the bell if he pays 10% of that $200,000, which comes up to roughly $20,000. The man said he had a, had a, has a job. What does he work at? He works at Walmart. He might make $20,000 a year. Now he has to now he has to prolong. Now he has to put up twenty thousand dollars to make bail. Is that possible for a man that works at Walmart? Is that possible for a man that's unemployed? So now where does he go? Once you once you receive your bail, you get twenty less than twenty four hours to make that bail. And if you don't make that bell, where do you go? You go to PPS. You go to the Philadelphia prison system. If you're unable to make the bell, then you're going to go to the county facility known as the Philadelphia prison system. And you're going to be housed and you're going to be detained until you either make bail or your case is heard. Now, for a case like a robbery, Commonwealth, they're not going to be ready in 30 days. Commonwealth, they're not going to be ready in 60 days. Commonwealth, they're not going to be ready in six months. So most of the times, an individual is going to be held over to custody. And he's going to sit there until, like I said, he makes bail. Or his case is heard. And if his case is heard and he's found guilty, 
there's a 90% chance that he will be sent to a state facility. There's a 90% chance that he's going to be sentenced to a state facility. More than 75% of the cases that are heard in the criminal justice system where the cases are heard at, more than 75% of them end up pleading out, which means the district attorney's office, the same one that brought the charges against them, the district attorney office does what? Offers a deal. They say, if you take this amount of time, we're going to give you your way out. If you plead guilty to this charge and that charge, we're going to get rid of those other charges. Here's the hook. This is why they give you so many charges. It's a lose-lose situation, but it's a win-win situation for them. You got 10 charges. They say, we're going to take seven of them. We're going to give you the three. Because they want to hold you to account, justly and unjustly. All they want is a conviction. Remember what we said in the beginning? They're going to look at your jacket. See if you've ever been here before. See if you've ever been convicted before. Because once you're convicted, now it's more easier for them to get a much higher bail. It's much easier for them to get much more time out of you. The prison industrial complex, it's a system. It's a system, it's a system of that strategic, strategically removing individuals from society. The prison industrial complex. From the components, the PPS. Every town has a PPS. Every town, if you go to Colorado, huh? They have a prison system. You go to North Carolina, they have a prison system. South Carolina, they have a prison system. New York, New Jersey, Boston, New Hampshire, New Brunswick, you name it, they have a prison system because they're all a part of the prison industrial complex. And this is why we're able to take and collectively collectively add up all of the institutions in America. And this is why we find out that America is the leading industry for prison population. This is what we find. This is what we find. We find that America is the leading industry for prison population. Remember a few weeks back, I gave you the numbers, 306,602, 1978. Reports have shown that there were 306,602 inmates under state and federal correctional authority. Now, when I spoke about PPS, PPS is the county. PPS is in the state. How many did I say is housed in the county on any, in any given day? Two to five to 10,000 people. In, in Philadelphia County. So when we talk about these numbers, these numbers aren't included when it comes to state and federal. These numbers are excluded. These don't count These because these people are detained. When you're under state and federal, you are sentenced. You have a sentence connected to your name. So what happens? What happened? Today, more than 1.5 million. Today, more than 1.5 million inmates under state and federal correctional authorities. It's way bigger than the PPS. It's an industry. It's the prison industrial complex. It's the prison community at large. 
the prison community at large. It's now 2020. Has anything changed from the 300,000 to 1.5 million? It's 2020, 2021. 2021, we're faced with a dilemma it's called mass incarceration. We're faced with a reality called mass incarceration. We're faced with a community of individuals housed and incarcerated in large, large quantities, promoting this agenda called mass incarceration. And we're going to end it with this. We're going to end it with this. And there's so much more. There's so much more. And I ask you all, I mean, purchase the book. Purchase the book. Purchase the book. I can only give you bit, bits and pieces and glimpses. The book does some justice, but it's just so much more. And I'm going to talk more because in, in, in the next up and coming book. The next up and coming book is going to even include even a lot more. Because this information has to be, be examined. And we really need to know what's direction we're, we're headed towards. What's best for our communities, our communities at large. So I close and I open in the name of Allah as a wajah. Wa kulu kawli hatha. Wa stak for the law wa liwa lakum. And that's what Allah wa ta'ala wa tofi wa thabat wa sadat. Until next time, guys. Peace. Hala. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound. Okay.